Christians seem comfortable taking Genesis in a variety of different ways. But what did Jesus, the Son of God, believe about Genesis? Today on Creation Magazine Live. Welcome to Creation Magazine Live. My name is Richard Fangrad, and I'm Calvin Smith. Today we're going to do kind of, uh, kind of, in, it's kind of becoming a series, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> today we're talking about what Jesus thought about Genesis, right. and in previous shows we've done what the church fathers believed about Genesis, and then what the reformers believed about Genesis. Right. Today we're talking about what Jesus believed about yeah, Genesis, the Son of God. Yes. Yeah. Um, now a recent uh, article in Faith Today magazine uh, summarized a survey commissioned by uh, the Canadian Bible Forum and the Evangelical. Fellowship of Canada. And this survey profiled Canadians in general um, and, and Christians specifically. And it revealed some sobering truths about evangelical Christians, yes. uh, to be yeah. honest, uh, regarding their Bible reading, the belief in God, uh, God's Word, uh, church attendance, this, this type of thing. And here are some of the findings. About one in seven Canadian Christians, or 14%, read the Bible at least once a week. The majority of Christians or sorry, the majority of Canadians, including those who identify themselves as Christians, read the Bible either seldom or never. Weekly Bible reading has fallen in half since 1996. Surprisingly, the frequency of Bible reading is much the same for older and younger readers, a change since 1996 when older Bible readers were more frequent than younger Bible readers. Only 18% of Canadians strongly agree the Bible is the Word of God, down from 35% in 1996. Canadians who strongly agree that the Bible is the Word of God are 10 times as likely to read the Bible frequently, at least a few times a week, and six times more likely to attend religious services weekly uh, as those who just moderately agree. Another thing it said was the majority of Canadians, as 69%, and half, 50% of Christians, believe that the Bible has irreconcilable contradictions. That's amazing. Mm. Among Canadians, almost no one, it's about 2%, uh, believes that the Bible, or, or almost no one, uh, who believes that the Bible has these, these contradictions, reads it very, very frequently. Very few Canadians with that belief attend religious services weekly, only 8%. Right. By contrast, Canadians who disagree that the Bible has irreconcilable contradictions are three times as likely to attend services weekly and nine times as likely to read the Bible frequently. Another thing it said was one in seven Canadians, about 13%, and about one in four Christians, 23%, strongly agree that the Bible is relevant to modern life. Canadians who strongly agree the Bible is relevant are more than 10 times as likely to read the Bible frequently. Well, that makes sense. Yep. Four times as much to attend services weekly, five times as likely to reflect frequently on its meaning for their lives, and almost 10 times as likely to talk to others about it at least weekly as those who just moderately agree. Right. So there, there are some of the survey results. Right. Now, some people might be thinking, well, okay, well, that's, that's Canada. You guys are Canadians. But actually, uh, most Western yeah. world countries really aren't that different yeah, when you see the, yeah. see the polls and, and things like that. Um, and basically, people's confidence in the Bible is waning. You can see a gradual decline in the Western world of people's confidence in the Bible. And, and if people don't be, believe the Bible's inerrant, they, they tend not to read it. They sure. tend not yeah. to believe it. They tend not to attend, attend church. Of course, this isn't a big surprise right, when yeah. you think about it. So many people are professing Christ, but they don't believe the Bible can be trusted. In a sense, they trust Jesus for uh, their salvation, but they don't trust his word as completely true. So a bit of right. a disconnect going yeah, on there. Begs the question, so. how, how do you know that the part of the Bible that says that they can be saved is true? Well, exactly. you know, yeah, yeah. Now, of course, um, nowhere else do we see uh, as much contention about God's word. Um, as, as, as the book of Genesis. That's why our ministry exists, hey, right? That's where we live. And that's where we live. You, you can talk to a lot of people, oh, I believe the Bible. Oh, what do you believe about Genesis? Well, you know, and there's all these no, different... No, no, yeah, it's not yeah, true. Yeah, yeah. yeah poetry. Um, and, yeah. yeah. And, and you've got evangelical leaders professing, uh, you know, faith in, in a plain meaning of God's word, and, and but they, they'll literally fall to pieces, you know, when, when, you, when you hit them with stuff, you know, yes. gap theory or day-age theory or, you know, whatever. Um, and 
why is it that the Genesis is hard to understand? Well, it's not hard to understand. It's because of science, right? That, that's where where the, the contention what's always science. what's called we science. That's right. Yeah, have that caveat there. It's not really science. It's a different version of history. Right, and it's supposedly proven the Genesis is wrong, and so now we got to make it conform with evolutionary ideas, and so now we got to you know and, and this type of so thing. So you twist and modify the biblical text to try to make it conform to what people have up here. And then where does it stop? Uh, right? Interesting. But Christians yeah. should take Jesus at his word. Right. Okay. If we get out of Genesis, let's yeah. look at what Jesus said. If you're a Christian, you've, uh, you're, Jesus is your Lord, you're following Christ, it's repentance, you're turning from your sin, following Christ, right. then uh, uh, they should take Jesus as the word. So let's have a look at what Jesus said about Genesis. That's what we're talking about on today's program. That's right. And we'll be back. In Job 40, in response to Job's questioning of God's wisdom, God sets out his credentials and challenges Job to answer a 77-question creation science exam. He says to Job, brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. The exam covers the breadth of God's creative power, mentioning the wonders of many animals that we are familiar with, such as the lion, raven, deer, ox and ostrich. Finally, there is Leviathan, a terrifying aquatic creature with an impenetrable hide impervious to harpoons, fearsome teeth and a back covered in rows of shields. It even has firebrands streaming from its mouth and smoke from its nostrils. Though this may sound mythological to us, Job recognized it as a real creature. Indeed, one candidate from the fossil record is Sarcosuchus, a 12-meter or 40-foot monster with an unusual bulbous cavity at the end of its snout that could conceivably have been used for mixing fire-generating chemicals. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. Welcome back. Today we're talking about what Jesus, the Son of God, said about Genesis, what he believed about Genesis. Right. That's our topic. Now, have you ever had someone tell you, you know, uh, the purpose of Genesis is to teach, you know, that God is our creator. We, we shouldn't get divisive over, you know, small little details yeah, the about... fall from perfection, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. Right, you know, yeah, yeah. Genesis teaches the theological truth about how or who, but, but not, you know... Um, exactly when he did it or, or, or these types of things. It's just to tell us that God, you know, created and, and these types of things. We don't have to worry about all the, the details or the history, those types of things. Right. right, yeah, well, the obvious answer is why should we trust Genesis when it says, where, where it says that God created if we can't trust it on the details? Right. I mean, if Genesis can't be trusted on things such as the Earth's age, which should be pretty simple just to state the Earth's age, uh, the sequence of creative acts upon it and so on, the flood that covered it, then why trust it on other details like who the Creator was exactly. and the purpose for creating and so on. Also, if Genesis 1 is merely meant to tell us that God is Creator, then we could just stop at verse 1. Well, of course. It would be a lot shorter. I mean, if the details aren't important, I mean, if I put an ad, you know, advertising, I've got a car for sale, and I say it's a blue car, and it's a, it's a, it's a 2007, and, and, you, and you show up, and all of a sudden, yes. well, the details are different than what I advertised. You're probably going to wonder, you know, well, if it's I'm a little red shady. Car with a lot of rust yeah. and no windshield. Yeah. <laughs> Might be important. <laughs> and, and, of course, something these, these critics have overlooked is that Genesis is written as real history. It, it is yes. not a poetic uh, book, or, and, and that's how Jesus took it. Um, and this is why the, the rest of the Bible actually treats the events, the people, and the time sequences as a real history, not parables, poetry, or allegory, or anything like that, because Jesus believed Genesis, yes. right, when we look at the New Testament. Yeah. So w when teaching about marriage, for example, Jesus said, but at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. That's Mark 10, 6 to 8. Okay, so here Jesus is quoting from a couple of places in Genesis. In chapter 1, verse 27, chapter 2, verse 24. Right. People actually feel those are contradictory accounts. Well, Jesus didn't. He quoted from both of them here in the New Testament. He didn't see them as contradictory. And obviously. the Pharisees didn't point out any contradiction, which they would have because they were the Jewish lawyers of the time, so right. they would have nailed yeah. them if he'd misquoted. So that, that concerns the first real couple, real man, real woman, right. not, not two men or two women or, or uh, uh, um, multiple different marriage partners and so on. Um, of course, evolutionists, inclu including theistic evolutionists, Christian theistic evolutionists, right. teach that instead the whole population of humans, everybody came from not two people, but about 10,000 people, maybe 100,000 years ago. Yeah. And that's, that's the popular teaching in those circles. That's right. Ape-like uh, ape creatures. Ape-like creatures, yes. <laughs> yeah, he, uh, hominids. Yeah. Also, in the context of what Jesus quoted, the two become one. 
because Eve was taken from Adam's side. So we kind of go back to that in marriage. The right. beautiful picture, actually, of the oneness in marriage. Yeah. A man leaves his parents because Adam had none and so on. Yeah. Furthermore, Jesus said that Adam and Eve were there from the beginning of creation. It's a right. key phrase, from the beginning of creation, not billions of years after God started creating. Exactly. This is really important because today the vast majority of Christians, not only in, in secular uh, academia, but also theological institutions, right, and Bible colleges, etc., believe and many teach that the secular billions of years is, is actually fact and that the uh, Christians should, right. should accept that. And this is in contrast to the teachings of Jesus, the Creator made flesh, right? As, as well as many of uh, several other biblical authors, of course. And, and they make it plain that, that this is wrong. People were there from the beginning of creation. That's not, the Bible's history, that's but right. the evolutionary history, the, the millions of years that many Christians sadly accept, has people there, I mean, one or two million years, people have been around for one or two million years, if you, depending on how you count people and then going back to the apes right. and the evolutionary world. And if the Big Bang's true, that was 13 and a half billion years ago, so yeah. we certainly weren't here at the beginning of creation. Not at all, no, right. no it doesn't work. Now, respected Christian uh, apologists like John Ankerberg, uh, Dr. John Ankerberg, Dr. Norman Geisler, um, who typically defend scripture and, and the Christians, yes, you know, yes, yes. They've, they've actually objected to this argument because they believe in millions of years. Yes. And, uh, that, you know, they, they say, no, Jesus wasn't a young earth creationist, and so we don't have to be, be ones. And in their article, Differing Views of the Days of Creation, Ankerberg and Geiser gave three reasons why this argument was supposedly false. Okay. Number one was, first, Adam was not created at the beginning, but at the end of the creation period on the sixth day, no matter how long or short these days were, Two, uh, the Greek word for create, which is kathesis, can sometimes uh, and, and does mean institution or ordinance, uh, okay. as in uh, 1 Peter 2.13. Um, and then since Jesus is speaking of the institution of marriage in, in, in Mark 10.6, they, they say, well, it could mean from the beginning of the institution of marriage. Right. right? And then the third point they said was that uh, e even if Mark 10.6 uh, is speaking of the original creation events, it doesn't uh, have to mean that there couldn't have been a long period of time involved in those creative events. Yeah, awesome. Um, these okay. three well, points. Let's, let's look at those three points when we come back. Yeah. Creation Ministries International staff, many from a wide variety of scientific disciplines, have produced thousands of articles now available in a massive online database. Some of the topics covered include the feasibility of Noah's Ark and evidence for a global flood, scientific arguments that explain observations in astronomy within a young Earth time frame, recent discoveries that support dinosaurs fitting with biblical history, evidence from biology that shows that the type of change that is observed in living things has absolutely nothing to do with evolution. Got questions? Get answers at creation.com. Well, if you just tuned in, we're talking about what did the Son of God, what did Jesus believe about Genesis? Yes, now we mentioned three points that uh, uh, listed by John Ankerberg and Norm Geisler to try to refute the argument from that Jesus wasn't a young earth creationist right. based on Mark 10, 6. So we'll reiterate those. Yeah. First, that Adam was not created at the beginning, but at the beginning of the creation, but at the end of the creation period, they said. The second argument, the Greek, Greek word for create, kathesis, can sometimes mean institution or ordinance. That was the heart of the second argument. The third one was, uh, even if Mark 10, 6 is speaking of original creation events, it doesn't mean that there couldn't have been long periods of time involved. So there are the three right. basic arguments. Now, the Bible says that from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. Now, you'll notice right. that in their first objection, they actually slip in the word period to make it say, well, it, from the beginning of yes. the creation period. But Jesus didn't say Adam and Eve were created at the beginning of the creation period, right? Um, because then Jesus would have been wrong. How did these guys miss this? If Jesus had said that Adam had been created at the beginning of the creation period, they would be saying that Jesus he was wrong. Was wrong because humans were created at the end of the creation period. Right. Yes. So they, they slip in this word here and they're shooting themselves in the foot. It, it, it's kind of strange. But anyway, um, how, how's that supposed to be a Christian apologetic? I don't really understand it. Anyway, yeah. he said from the beginning of the creation, he's talking about the whole creation from Jesus' day back to the first moment of creation. Yes, yes. In other words, Jesus is saying that Adam and Eve were created at the beginning of history. That, that's what he's saying. From the beginning of the creation, he created the male and female. And you get that from the plain reading of the text. Right. Yeah. And, and you, you also see a parallel passage in, in, uh, to Mark 10 found in Matthew 19, 4, where Jesus said, He answered, Have you not read that he who, made, who created them um, from the beginning made them male and female? 
right? And, and Jesus is, is, uh, says that Adam and Eve were simply at the beginning, right? right. At the beginning. Uh, later on, we, we, we see Mark 10, 6, from the beginning of creation. So Jesus uses the exact same Greek words uh, translated as from the beginning of creation in Mark 13, 19 also, uh, when he says, for in those days there will be such great tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now and never will be. And, and in this verse is clearly speaking uh, of, of, of all time from the first uh, beginning of the creation days. So we see again that, that this yeah. common usage yeah. So actually, by, by adding this one word here, period, Ankerberg and, and Geisler have put, uh, you know, put a spin, basically, on what Jesus said. Yeah, so point one really, Fails. really doesn't yeah. work. Uh, secondly, the Greek word for create, kathesis, can sometimes mean institution or ordinance, but of course, uh, like any word, its usage is based on context. Right. Words have different meanings. You understand the meaning by the context. First of all, Jesus could have easily said, from the first marriage or from the beginning of marriage, or since God created man, or since God created Adam, something like that. It would have been easy if, to say. It would have been easy if that's what he meant. Yeah. And if, the, if we give the word kathesis in Mark 10, 6, the meaning of authority or institution, it doesn't make any sense. Right. It's another thing that just doesn't fly. What does from the beginning of authority or beginning of institution mean? To make the text meaningful, Ankerberg and Geisler would have had to insert another word that from, has no justification. Right, from the beginning of the institution, of, like they have, they add things Something and it's else. not there. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Uh, it, let's be honest, who by reading the plain text of the, of the New Testament there, from the beginning of creation he made the male and female, would ever have dreamt up from the institution of marriage he made the male and female? Right. It, it's, I mean, without the, ad nobody, Nobody thinks that. It doesn't make sense. Exactly. Uh, Jesus is reaching further back in history uh, for the basis of his teaching on marriage. The, the Pharisees, of course, go back to the time of Moses, and, right. and they, they, they take their teaching from Moses and so on, and Deuteronomy and, and that kind of thing. Whereas Jesus goes back to the beginning of time. Uh, Jesus spoke uh, 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 these words about 4,000 years after creation. We can do a bit of an analogy here. Right. If we compare those 4,000 years to a 24-hour day right. and work out the timing, uh, then Jesus was speaking at the end of the day. At the, that, that's if we make well, that, that 24 the, hour the period. 24 hour period. Adam and Eve being created on the, the sixth literal day of that 4,000 years would have been about half a second. After creation. After creation. That's from the beginning, from of, the beginning the of the creation. From the beginning of creation. It's a plain, simple understanding of that text. And right. we'll be right back with more details. In 2008, the BBC produced a controversial documentary on the harmful effects of pedigree dog shows. According to the documentary, many dog breeders are causing dangerous levels of inbreeding. This results in dogs with crippling genetic deformities. One RSPCA vet said, What I see in front of me is a parade of mutants. It's some freakish, garish beauty pageant. Most of our domestic varieties have numerous problems due to harmful mutations, and the inbreeding involved in maintaining breed purity tends to amplify these defects further. The changes we see in dogs today give no support to evolutionary expectations. After dogs originated from an ancestral wolf-type creature, their genomes have undergone mutational decay. Their genomes have suffered information corruption and loss, but not the creation of new genetic information that evolution needs to be believable as a mechanism for changing microbes into mangoes, mutts and mankind. Kind. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. Well, welcome back. We were just discussing uh, three points that uh, Dr. Ankerberg and Geisler had used to try to rebut this argument, the Young Earth Creation Issues, where Jesus said, well, from the be beginning of the creation, God made the male and female. Now, we didn't get to point three where they said, that even if Mark 10 is speaking of the original creation events, it doesn't mean that it could not have been a long period of time involved in those creative events. I mean, usually these guys display some good logic here, so this is kind of <laughs> troubling why they would even mention this. It's obvious that if you add billions of years to the Genesis account, if you don't take yes. it to six literal days, where do you put those billions of years? You had to put them in the day, six days of creation. Which man, put man, them before Adam was created, right? Yeah. And so you then there's millions of years, and so the whole. Fr so I, I don't even know why they they, they use that argument. It, it just falls flat. But yeah. anyway, <laughs> we yeah. had to three, deal with it. Th uh, three three points that don't really uh, right. Uh, so, don't really so line up. Obviously, these guys, if they take Jesus as Lord, Jesus believed Genesis, 
Young Earth, Six Day Creation, that, that's what Jesus quoted. Yes, so. very, very clear. Yeah. There's, the New Testament contains 103 references to the book of Genesis. 15 are by Jesus directly, and all of those, refer, those 15, refer to Genesis chapters 1 to 11. That's right. That's sort of where we live as a ministry, yeah. uh, dealing with those, the events there. Uh, and those are, those are, of course, that's the highly contested ones that, uh, that our ministry deals with. Right, because um, old earth believers have to, in a sense, challenge those because it talks about a great flood that would explain the rock layers, but they believe the rock layers happened over millions of years. Of years. So it's always Genesis 1 to 11 yes, that they're attacking. Yes. Now, now, Jesus' use of Genesis, uh, the ones you referred to, sets the tone of how uh, it would be used in the rest of the New Testament when you think about it. He use it, uses it to both explain doctrine and to draw historical uh, analogies. Uh, an example of the, of the former use is in Matthew 22, 15 to 22 where uh, the Pharisees and the Herodians questioned him about taxes. Right. Um, he's, it says, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, whose likeness is an inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Then he, he said to them, Therefore render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled and they left him and went away. Now, for Jesus, because the coin bared, bore uh, Caesar's image, it was Caesar's property and should be rendered to him. Sure. But he adds the yep. command to give to God what's God because we're created in the image, image of, of God. God. Yes. And so Jesus is referring here back to Genesis 1, 26 and, and, and uh, 27. But of course, if humanity had not been made in the image of God, if we'd like been in some proto-human right. hominid or something yes. like that, then the whole precedent actually falls, falls to pieces, right? Yeah, his teaching falls apart at yeah. that point there. In, in Luke 11, 50 to 51, Jesus says that the blood of all the prophets, which was shed from the foundation of the world, may be required of this generation, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zacharias. So obviously Jesus took Genesis 1 to 11 as real history. Right, there's a genealogy there's there. A genealogy, you see the genealogy is there. He describes Abel, uh, uh, who was from the beginning. He says he was there at the beginning from the foundation of the world, not millions of years after the foundation of the world. Exactly. In Matthew 24, 37 to 39, Jesus said, For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days, before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Now, obviously, this is really easy to understand as well. Old sure. earthers have yeah. to make the flood local so that they can explain away all the rock layers, etc., yeah. um, having occurred you know, over millions of years, etc. But Jesus says that his second coming will sweep them all away. So it's not a localized event. It's the entire globe, just yes. like the global flood. Yeah. Now, now we could go on here, but uh, let's talk about one thing that should be pointed out. Those who believe in the inspiration of God's Word take it as God breathed. Right. God breathed out the Word, which means God inspired the writers to keep them free from error. Their, their personality, their writing style shines through, right. but God, what they produce is error free. That's right. the bottom line. So essentially, all of the Bible could be red lettered. <laughs> you have one of those red letter editions because it, it's all been written by God. Yes, That's right. he worked through people, but it's, it's all God's Word. That's right. So Jesus believed Genesis because he's the creator. And we read this in, in Colossians 1.16. It says, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. Right. Now, Here's some examples, and there are many more that we could get to, but uh, really suggest this, this book, uh, Refuting Compromise by Dr. Jonathan Sarfati. Yes. And yeah. uh, if you'd like to get this book, it, it, it's probably the premier creationist book to, to overcome some of these objections from, from Christian theologians that it have is. tried to get around it. Yeah. And uh, you can actually receive this book for 30% off if you um, just go to the website and you can use the code CMLRC. Uh, you will actually receive uh, Refuting Compromise for 30% off. Encourage you to do that, study it well, and we'll be back. Yeah. Many Christians today have a diminished view of the Bible because they can't answer questions like, is there really a God? What about evolution? Are there facts to back up the Bible? Or is it all just faith? Creation Ministries expert speakers visit churches all over the world to help pastors equip their congregations to understand that the whole Bible, even Genesis, is accurate. We help to demolish the arguments that the world uses to try to convince people that the Bible isn't true. For more information on getting a CMI speaker to visit your church, contact your nearest CMI office through our website. 
Well, our topic today has been, what did the Son of God believe about Genesis? And now we've seen that uh, he was a young earth creationist. <laughs> That's yes, basically yeah. what, what we looked at. a lot else that we could be talking about. Exactly. Yeah. Now, um, this is a feedback section. What I wanted to do here is show an example of how um, theologians have tried to get around some of these arguments we, we use. We use the argument from Mark 10, 6, where Jesus said from the beginning of the creation, God made the male and female. And I wanted to use an example of an article that Dr. Carl Whelan had used. Yes. But when he went to talk to a prominent theologian in Australia one time just to have a hot beverage and, and discuss some of these things because this fellow was an old earther and, and of course Carl's representing CMI and they just wanted to meet together as Christians and discuss these things. And, and just a fascinating uh, article and you can check out the link below if you wanted to read the whole thing but you can uh, set okay, up some of yeah. the things that were said. Yeah, so he, he writes this. This is Dr. Carl Wieland. The most striking and sad example of this switch in authority source I know of comes from personal experience. In Melbourne, Australia, many years ago, I had arranged to sit down over a hot drink with a distinguished university professor, a Christian who was well known for his active opposition to a straightforward view of Genesis. At that time, he was actually the head of a grouping of Christian academics which had been openly set up to provide opposition to the inroads our ministry was making. It's kind of interesting. Yeah. Uh, over the years, this group had, has unfortunately been very effective in persuading most Christian training institutions that compromising on biblical creation in favor of secular thinking, evolution and long ages, is the only respectable position. This professor himself, in addition to his secular science qualifications, was well regarded in the theological area as being very well, uh, very biblically literate. He had, at the time, already been a frequent guest lecturer at several leading Australian evangelical training institutions. During our courteous exchange, I asked him about the above comments by Jesus in relation to the age of the world. I asked, isn't it clear that Jesus taught and believed that the world was young. Right now, he, he said he got a stunning response. He said, I expected him to do as other Christian evolutionists have done, uh, to try to find ways to torture the text to escape these obvious implications. Yes. Instead, he, he, he said, uh, what he said, um, he, he, he he said that he totally agreed that Jesus believed in a recent creation of all things. Okay. And, and then he said, Carl said, well, well, then how do you deal with this? And he said, Jesus didn't know as much about science as we do. And Carl was, you can read the article, he's obviously stunned. Can you believe that? Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and uh, you know, Carl said he kind of stumbled and he was so shocked. He said, well, yeah. well Jesus wouldn't lie and, and God, you know, uh, you know, these kinds of things. And, and then the fellow said, ah, but that's where it gets co very complex. It has to do with the theology of the incarnation. Oh, yes. Where yes. Jesus deliberately laid aside many of the things that, uh, that had to do with his pre-incarnate uh, divinity. And Carl actually admits he was so stunned by the, the response that he... he he didn't really have a good one, so he, 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 he thought, well, if I had a chance now and to redo, here's some of the things I would have, have, have pointed out. Number one, the fellow admitted, yeah, Jesus believed in a young earth, yeah. right? But he was wrong. But he was but wrong, that, and that God allowed amazing. for 2,000 years Christians to believe falsehoods. Yeah. Not just that Jesus was, you know, limiting what he, he, he knew of, but he actually taught falsehoods. So anyway, just, uh, just a stunning, stunning um, admission. Anyway, just a, a, a reminder to us to, uh, to take God's word as plainly written, not the theories of man. That's right. See you next time.